Okay, uh, I reckon I'm going to start. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, thank you to Robin, who isn't here now, but who's helped set this thing up. Um, the, uh, the main contention of, of this webinar specifically is that uh, the idea that the medium informs the message. Uh, that means that the, the process by which uh, a work comes into existence contributes to the fundamental aspect of, of what that work has the potential to become. Um, I'm not necessarily a believer that this is true of every message of every medium, um, but I do think that in my practice personally of using um, specifically 35 millimeter film for documentary photography, there is a strong argument um, to be had that the medium small format film does impact the message, which is the story being told. Um, the webinar won't be necessarily a discussion on what's better or worse. Um, it's more about what works for me and what makes sense to me. Um, the things that I, that I say and discuss might make more or less sense to you. It might make your work better or worse after hearing my thoughts. Um, and during the Q&A at the end, I'll do my best to answer questions as you might have uh, in order to support your own practices in this area. Um, if anyone does have questions throughout while I'm talking, if you put them into the uh, Q&A section rather than the chat box, then at the end, I'll be able to go through those and, and answer them specifically. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Everyone's able to see the presentation so far, right? That's, that's coming through correctly as a, as a shared screen before I move into the next one. Okay, great. Cool, thank you so much. Uh, so firstly, the message. Um, the message that we'll be communicating or that I, I, I set out to communicate is usually a photo essay containing a documentary story. Um, that's currently the majority of my time is spent on um, investing my life into kind of different communities, different ideas. And, and in that time, I'll be piecing together um, what will ultimately be, a, ultimately be a story, which will be told hopefully clearly through photographs. Um, the absolute basic of what I think needs to be included in order to put together a documentary essay is something that's structured with a beginning, a middle and an end. So a story arc. And that story arc contains the ideas of who, what, when, where, why and how. Um, when it comes to the presentation, they don't necessarily need to be in this order. Um, but I won't really consider a project close to, to being at a level where I can look at it with a critical eye until I have these aspects covered and covered well. And I think if one of these aspects is weak or failing, then I need to look at how to address that, how to go back and go over it again, because all of these aspects need to be very, very clear because an audience who hasn't been there with me photographing won't know the story. It's down to me to tell it to them effectively. Um, the medium that this message will be put on is 35 millimeter film in my instance. Um, now that we understand what the message includes, uh, I'll be able to get to the discussion, which I think is the, the thing that most people are interested in here, which is how that film lends itself specifically to work in a way that enhances these photographs and enhances the project overall. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of ideas to uh, choose to work with film, but I think that many who discuss it are, are, are focusing on the, the kind of aesthetic result in the way that, you know, different film stocks can offer um, different looks to the final result. This isn't really uh, a particularly valid reason to me, especially when it comes to, you know, the specific application of documentary photography. Instead, for me, it's the physical nature of film that, that really appeals. Um, from beginning to end, it's the tangible artifact which offers me a few benefits over a digital file. Uh, the physical film that I take out with me to work, load into my camera, expose to light, develop, print, scan and archive, is always the same physical thing. It's never something else. Um, when I hold that developed negative, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't represent um, a copy. It was literally there with me in that place when I put an image onto it, uh, which is very different to an SD card. Um, when you load an SD card into a computer and transfer files across, you're working with a copy of a copy. Um, the original pretty much vanishes in a way. And I think that there's even you know, even in a subtle way can affect the perception of, of kind of true ownership, true creatorship. Um, to me, film is limited, digital is unlimited. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits of this means that film is, is a, provides a verifiable format. Um, 
film representing the original is great when it comes to identifying kind of the, the truth, the veracity of, of that photograph. Um, the original negative will always prove every copy that is reproduced from it as a stencil. Um, without that true original file, digital photography can be much harder to trust. And I think even, you know, raw files can be manipulated. EXIF data can be changed. It can be removed from sequence. You're, you're never really working with an original file. So an audience won't see what you consider to be an original. There, there, there's no real means of verifying it. Um, on the other hand, with film, I've made photographs which people, you know, they're interested in uh, learning more about that image or learning about the, the, um, the context that image exists in. And I'm able to, to very specifically show, you know, like a video of the negative with the, um, with the rest of the strip, or if they have questions about, um, you know, whether or not something's real or not, it's, it's very difficult to fake the physical negative. Um, so, I, so I can go through many different uh, ways of verifying that negative to them. Um, this ties into ideas around manipulation, which I think is very, very uh, prevalent. Um, in, in digital photography, it's a, it's a key factor that, um, you know, digital manipulation, even to the, to the raw file, um, happens in commercial photography and, and manipulation doesn't necessarily only need to be to something that happens to the file itself. It can, it can also be, um, like deleting the context from around an image, removing one file from the context of other files. Um, for, for documentary photography, um, you know, there, there's very little room for, for questioning and interpreting. Um, I, I have to tell my story in a way that's understood. And if people are asking questions about the images after seeing them, then, it, you know, it means I haven't told the story effectively enough. Um, when I'm looking to produce an honest account, film gives me that physical proof to show that, you know, I, I didn't make things look like this. I didn't change the shape or add or remove elements. Here's the negative. This is the room that I have for exposure adjustment of a print or a scan. Here's the line at which that becomes destructive manipulation. And on top of that, I can present, um, you know, the, the non-manipulated context. You know, here's what happens. Here's what's happened next on the, on the, on the uh, negative strip, physically, literally ne next to one another. They can't be removed in the way that a digital file can. While you can manipulate negatives, um, sorry, while you can manipulate um, the result of a negative, the negative itself will always be kind of testimony to what's ha what's happened there. Um, and I've always phrased, phrased it with this idea that the negative will, will haunt anyone who's, you know, looking to deliberately misrepresent their images. Um, this is especially important to anyone who's working on a documentary story which involves a narrative which someone might question. You can always back up your account in a strong way with those physical negatives, much less so with digital files. Um, on this slide, the photograph, um, this was taken near Westgate on Sea, um, and it's, uh, it was as a man walked out his two dogs um, across a kind of jetty. Uh, if you look on the left, you can see that there's the reflection of one of the dogs just as he kind of jumped into the water, um, but you can't see the dog himself. Now, if, it, if this was a digital photograph, I think most people would assume that the dog was just photoshopped out and removed, you know, with like a spot removal tool. But because you know it's a film photograph, you know that it's a genuine illusion that the that the dog is just in line with the wall. So the um, you know there's no figure to ground. It's a black on black um, subject. Uh, so so the dog isn't really rendered, only the reflection. You can trust that's real because it's a film photograph. You know that there's no way to remove that dog. Um, without you know an extensive amount of work, whereas when it's digital files, it's much easier to assume that something's fake. Um, outside of the original frame, film can also give us a lot. Um, it can tell us a lot about the way that it was shot. Um, as I mentioned before, um, it, it's possible to to separate an individual raw file out from the. Um, from the context and let it exist on its own. On film, this requires, you know, the literal physical removal from the rest of a role um, because film exists as one unit, uh, which happens when you, you know, you, you, you do um, cut the film up into strips when you archive them in sleeves, but the role isn't separate from itself. It can always be read in that sequence of frame one, two, three, and so on. Um, because digital files don't have that physical bond, they can be taken out of context entirely. Um, 
individual raw files don't tell us that that context you know and in order to see that kind of prior and consecutive sequence of images you need to look over so many more individual files um they may still exist individually but anything could have been done to them individually as well um i also find that the context with film is great for personal growth because you're seeing you know the the, the film context sheets uh with, with that kinds of uh, bird's eye view over your work um I heard this idea that you know um i, I don't know if, if this idea is actually true or not but you know if your if your phone is compromised if someone has access to to read um you know the, the messages that you're writing on your phone um they can also see drafts as you're writing and deleting whereas when you hit send that final message that you've sent on your phone is you know the version of yourself that you've committed to um, and that's what you identify with. But if you can read the messages as they're being written, you can actually see iterations and versions of, of that person, you know? Um, that's what I think a contact sheet provides is that it's that insight into the, the train of thought of the photographer, the building blocks of the creative process. Um, you know, you can observe them quite clearly. Uh, whereas, you know, when, when you're working with digital files, it's much easier to just discard and throw away a, a, a raw and you never need to look at it again. Um, Whereas even my negatives, which I hate, I don't bin because they're always connected to a role which has some redeeming qualities, hopefully, you know, and, and, and when you revisit that context of the, the image that was created in, it can, um, it can show you and reveal to others the process that occurred. Um, one of the best things to me about film is that a shot of film is not the final image it's always still the in-between step which requires you to do something further to it in order for you to see that image um with a digital process once you you know once you've pressed the button you can pretty much usually see the photo immediately so if for some reason you wanted to you know you could even just have a gallery of just the backs of cameras showing those digital files um and you can call that a finished vision and and you know be fairly correct with that um Whereas film works as a stencil, uh, originally you needed a dark from print process, but today you can uh, make them visible much easier uh, via digital scanning. Um, but I think that when you produce work digitally, because you're contributing to, to a, a life, which is, you know, so many, so many of our lives are lived through the screen, that there's less of an urge to print from that JPEG unless you have the facilities already set up to do that for yourself. Um, if you don't form a habit of putting your work into print, then you miss what it can offer that the, the, the screen can't offer. Um, you know, you, 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 uh, you take your digital file, you put it on your computer, you see it on the screen. And because you can see it on the screen, you, you kind of assume that it's finished. You know, you enjoy it in that moment. Um, but I, I wouldn't call that a photograph yet. I, you know, it's, it's still just a screen. It's going to be something else as soon as you click away. Um, it's not a... You know, it's not a fixed point. It's not a, a, something that represents itself. Um, so at some level, I think that if your work only exists that way, it's not going to feel complete in a way that's, you know, meaningful and fulfilling. Um, the film process relies on the fact that film is a middleman. So print is a more comfortable option from that. Uh, the physical film, like I've said a few times, is a stencil. The reason it's a negative is so that you literally stencil the light through it um, onto... onto um, sensitive paper um i don't think of my negatives as pictures i see them as as um something that i'm going to produce from it whereas someone can look at their raw and see it as the picture itself um when i do produce digital scans i look at them as a scan of a negative not as the photograph the the um those scans can be used when i'm producing a publication for example and i'll print those scans out into the publication um, but, it, but, you know, in that way, they then become a real photograph and they exist independently from others. Um, those I would produce more into a, a darkroom print as individuals. Um, but the, the experience of all three of these things, whether it's a, a darkroom print, a digital image from a scan or a printed scan, they all have different uses for my workflow. Um, and I, I, I think about all of them when I'm at each of the stages of producing a photo narrative. Um, based on this, uh, you know, we have the medium, we have the message, um, the fil film practice and, and this aspect is, is specific to me, um, to what works to me. And I've arrived on this workflow, uh, through, um, experimentation and trial and error 
I'm always adjusting like aspects of this. There's no definitively correct way to do any of, of what I do with my work. Um, so I start off, I have my story mapped out. I have a rough idea of who, what, when, where, and why I'm going to include. Um, or I'll have, at, I'll start with at least one of these that I've, I've come across as an idea, which I'll then be unpacking through my time in the field. Um, beginning, middle and end, I think are, are less clearly defined usually for me. Um, those are ideas that tend to present themselves to me while I'm working, while I spend a long amount of time um, unpacking that original idea. These can be things like um, character arcs, uh, a shifting physical landscape where you're documenting the change in something physically, uh, a behavioral arc or, um, or a story arc that leads you through uh, kind of introducing ideas and then developing ideas and then bringing them to a logical conclusion. Um, that resolution or conclusion again is not something I try and plan for because it does tend to happen naturally through, through working in the field. Um, a kind of logically assigned conclusion can be from something like a time constraint. So if you say I'm going to shoot over a certain amount of time, I'm going to shoot, uh, you know, six months of this story. Or if it's a character arc, then you can use a milestone like a birthday or a wedding or a funeral um, to, to kind of mark the end of that story. Um, and sometimes it can be the photographer's own story that you're kind of marking out with time, um, which provide that kind of beginning, middle and end. But I, I personally try and avoid this unless it's in line with the story that I'm telling. So uh, preparations for field work, which is an idea that I've discussed in a few of my other webinars, so I won't get too detailed into this. Um, but essentially, if you're starting from scratch, looking to produce a documentary story with film, um, you'll need you know, a camera, a camera that works. For me, uh, my gear tends to be that I'll take with me uh, most places, uh, it'll be an M6 and an M2 with a 35, 50 and 90 millimeter lenses. Uh, I'll usually have a 35 millimeter fixed to the M2 and my M6 will be fixed with the 90 and I'll switch out the 90 for a 50, depending on kind of the, uh, the scene I'm working at the moment. Um, before starting a project, always make sure that your cameras work. Uh, for film cameras, this means putting a test roll through it. Uh, that's a very valuable thing to get into the habit of before spending, you know, six months out working. Um, things that you'll need to check with the camera are like rangefinder alignment, mechanical smoothness, integrity of cloth shutters, uh, of which film likers have two. Um, shutter speeds can be checked at the slow end using any one second timer, and the faster speeds will need a test roll to make sure that they're on for what you want to be exposing for. Um, if any aspect of your camera is failing, then I recommend a CLA before you start working. Uh, realistically, you'll get a, a few good years out of a CLA, five years if you like really smash through your frames, um, 10 years if you're a lighter shooter, um, like a shooter, sorry, lighter shooter. Um, and I think of this a bit like an MOT for your camera. Um, all mechanical devices ultimately are going to need servicing at some point, and it's better to do this before you start with a long term project than kind of have something happen halfway through. Um, if any aspect does need a CLA, then uh, into, if you any of you are UK based looking for a service, then I recommend PPP cameras. Um, he seems to be the most reliable and affordable option that I've encountered. Um, and for those of you abroad, there are some great technicians, I'm sure in your area who you can reach out to, but you'll have to uh, research based on forums uh, where you're based. Um, in terms of choosing what film to use, uh, I tend to stock up for consistency. I like to shoot my projects across, um, you know, maybe one or two stocks so that things look um, fairly similar so that I'm not worrying about, um, you know, turning the page and, and being presented with something that looks completely different. That happens through the composition and through decisions I'm making rather than something the film's done. Um, if I'm using black and white film, which I do tend to, uh, I'll, I'll go for something quite versatile like HP5, which, you know, you can pull that to 200, you can push that to 3200 and have very usable results. Um, consistency there means that all my images, whatever they're shot at with that same role will tend to work in sequence. Nothing will seem odd or out of place. Um, with color, you can actually buy different options at different speeds. I know that there's a portrait 160, 400 and 800. Um, you can push these if you find a lab that will do it. Otherwise, if you're just careful with the exposures, um, you'll have fairly consistent results from those. I don't really shoot a lot of color. I tend to use black and white, which I think most suits a storytelling project specifically. Um, but if you're interested in color photography practice, I have 
um, done enough that I can answer any questions on that in the CLA, um, in the Q&A at the end. Really sorry about that. Um, but if, if something's outside of my knowledge, then I can refer you to somewhere that will have answers. Um, I've also uh, written a few articles for a blog called Emulsive, um, which cover um, color photography and black and white, but also specifically uh, using black and white film for documentary photography. Uh, so if you search just documentary black and white in my name, uh, you'll find that article. Um, of the films that are available today, you're making a decision between uh, black and white film, C41 color and E6 slide. Um, if you're spending months on a project, it can be very tempting to kind of chop and change between different options. Uh, but I, I really do recommend to stick with just one uh, format per story. Um, I think that black and white, uh, black and white photography, uh, black and white film is, is versatile, it's cheap, and I control the entire process from the beginning to end. The role never leaves me at any point during the process. Um, you can treat color and E6 films similarly, including um, uh, home development methods. Um, I haven't taken the direction of home uh, development with color in E6, and that you should know uh, pretty much before you start what the eventual format of the project is going to be. You should already have done your experimentation um, during the research and development phase of the project. Um, you should know things like how large the images are going to be displayed, whether they're going to be in print or in, um, you know, in a publication bound, um, and all of that's going to inform the way that you choose which films you're going to use. Um, I tend to start with kind of a base amount of roles when I'm rationing out for my, um, for my projects. Um, I usually do one for each narrative beat that I want to be hitting. So that's one role for each of the who, what, when, where, why, and how, that's six, plus another three to cover kind of the beginning, middle, and end. That doesn't mean I'm gonna be shooting one role for a beginning, one role for a middle, one role for an end, but I like to allocate them in my mind that roughly it will happen over the course of those roles. Um, you need to kind of rely on self-knowledge of how you shoot, which, which does change over time. I used to work with maybe a role every two days when I was doing mostly sleep photography. Um, but when I'm in a situation with purpose and with a story that I know I'm telling, I'll average maybe two or three roles a day. Uh, when I was recently shooting a project in Bulgaria for two weeks, that was 15 roles, um, which is just over one per day. Um, so half a camera's worth of, of images each day. But then when I was photographing in DC in January during the inauguration, that was over three days that I was there and I shot seven rolls, which is 252 frames. Um, that's a much more concentrated story uh, where I was shooting lots and lots of different situations across a very limited amount of time, but it works out as half as many rolls as I spent in two weeks, you know, in, in, in one fifth of the time. Um, as such, I'll usually... Uh, ration myself at three rolls a day when I know I'm going to be out there in the field working on the project I'll carry maybe five to ten in my bag um, and if I'm traveling somewhere and spending maybe a month there that means I'll take just under a hundred rolls um, but I'll always round up uh, and accommodate for more um, because it's, it's better to return with unshot rolls excess than to find yourself short when you're in the field um, like I said with consistency I'll try and take as few variations as possible um, you know, I can do most things with HP5+, Plus, but I'll always be looking to bring a few reserve rolls of like a 3200 speed film um, for which both Ilford and Kodak offer great options. Um, and that will be used when I need to push past 6400 or, you know, for night shooting or indoor candlelight or something like that. Um, HP5 is usually enough for, for most of what I want to be using and I can push it to 3200 uh, using stand development, which is how I develop everything. Um, and again, it's something I can discuss more about if people want me to during the Q&A, but it's also something I've written about before, so you can Google and find that. Um, the photograph on uh, this slide is uh, candlelight, um, and that's at F2, one thirtieth of a second, while pushing 400 speed to 1600. Uh, I'll just, between slides, I'll just take in with Robin. Is everything okay with, with, with how this is running? Or yeah, make it's, changes now that you're in. Yeah, yeah, it's all working well. All looking okay, good. Great. Uh, any notes that you want to um, feed into this before I move on to the next slide? Well, just that I'm sorry that I'm late. Uh, no, no, not, you don't sure, apologize. <laughs> not sure if Simon explained that I got 
stuck in um, like the worst transport situation. So it took me three hours to get home rather than 40 minutes. But I'm here and looking forward to seeing more of this and yep. of course the Q&A that will follow. Yeah, I got to say, I, I wasn't expecting to feel as much pressure as I was when I when I switched this on and, and you know, <laughs> did all the recording and stuff. I stumbled over a few, um, you know, I had a few slips of the tongue in uh, some of the things I was saying purely through nerves, which is not something I'm used to. used to be uh, blown well now, so let's, yeah, I don't um, want to interrupt. Yeah, back to normal normalcy. Um, uh, when it comes to rating my film, especially because I do a lot of work uh, in England uh, where you know, we have some days where we can transition between eight different types of weather within the space of half a day. It can be very, very difficult to decide on how to rate my film because obviously once you put it in the camera and set your meter, you're committed to that speed. Um, even if I'm carrying two cameras, I prefer not to have one camera at one speed, one camera at another speed because I like to have consistency between the two and only really use them for focal length changes rather than sensitivity changes. Um, but for some of you, that could be a solution if you want to work with one camera with one speed loaded, another camera with another speed loaded. Um, if it's going to be a difficult changeable day then my solution is just to load in an, uh, a roll rate at 800 speed because uh, that covers me pretty much through bright light which I can shoot at 1000th f16 with, with sunny 16 uh, it covers me through dark shadow and it covers me for situations where I'm moving between something indoor and outdoor uh, I'll tend to have enough um, aperture changeability between f2 and f16 with you know, any of my lenses, um, which is the main aspect of exposure that I'll be looking to change to accommodate for that shifting light. Um, if I know in advance that it's going to be a very, very bright summer's day, then I'll load in 100 or 200 speed. Um, but if I get halfway through a day where I've shot through with 200 speed, I'll usually put in 400 just because I know I'll be moving into the night. Um, for winter, it'll be, you know, 800 or 1600 as standard, 16 when I know it's going to be especially dark. Um, Almost uh, always when possible, unless it's very, very dark, my shutter speed will match my ISO speed, um, which is based on the, the kind of rule of thumb, which is sunny 16, which I can get into if you have a, a question about that, but that's quite a common way of, of um, uh, loading um, a roll and rating it. But it allows me to only change the aperture throughout the day, um, which does affect the way that I shoot my images, but I can, I can get into that later. later. Um, Obviously, once I'm in the field and finish a roll, I'll unload it as quickly as possible. Um, depending on the situation, if I'm shooting with someone else, I'll keep. I'll ask them to keep an eye out for something that might be happening. Uh, that's one of the reasons I prefer to shoot with company. Um, and then I'll have uh, my film in my bag. I know exactly where each of my ISOs is that I can select from, so I can load it in. You know, not miss anything important. I haven't yet in my career so far missed anything super important due to reloading. I know that's something sometimes people worry about. Um, but I'll also try and preempt what might be happening through the day so I know that I can inform the way that I'm, you know, loading, unloading at different points, at different lulls during, during different events. Um, so at this point, you have your camera and lens ready, you have your film loaded, and you're now looking to photograph something that's happening in front of you. You know, how do you go about doing that in a, in a way that's different to what you might do on digital? Um, if I'm composing on film, then I want to be getting the frame correct. I don't want to be wasting any of the surface area of the physical medium that I'm using. Um, I do my best to stay very frugal with the way that I shoot. Uh, so I'd be very dis discretionary about what I, you know, what I actually choose to press the shutter for um, when I'm actually going to spend a shot, you know, only when I'm absolutely certain that all the elements I want to include are in the right place, will I be ready to make an image. Um, I want to emphasize, I really, really don't want to waste film. Um, film is a physical plastic uh people have issues with that sometimes but it, for me it means that if i waste a shot there's a gravity to that i, I you know I, I feel a physical loss i don't want to just be frivolous and, and shoot you know everything i want to make sure that every single rectangle of my film goes towards an overall kind of positive contribution which isn't something i take very lightly um sometimes i end up actually wasting a frame by not taking two and getting it right for example um, if I'm photographing a detail, I understand that I need to capture both the detail that I want and also the context that a detail exists in, which means that I need to spend two images to make one overall idea. Um, without that second image, the first will you know, pretty much be useful for the project, uh, useless uh, to the project. Um, sometimes you, you can't just make one frame do everything you want it to. 
Uh, and if I try and attempt this, it usually doesn't work out and I tend to not have that element for my story. So it's, an, it's a net loss. Um, and sometimes I'll also kind of overinvest in a scene because I think if I spend, you know, one more frame, that will be the good one. Um, if the scene is the same, it's the same. I, I think you should try and get the, the frame that you want to move on. Um, the photograph that I've put here along with the uh, context strip um, is from 2019. Um, I, I, I gravitate toward this scene because it's a kind of a cluster of characters. You've got the shoes resting underneath the bare feet on the left and you've got the two characters on the right. Um, because I was kind of uncertain about things that I think might have moved in the background while I was taking it, I spent three frames on this. But realistically, if you look at what those three frames are, they're all basically the same image. If I was going to put these in a project, they would all be saying the same thing. Um, you know, if, if, I, if I find that I've shot a frame and I'm staying in place after making that image, I have to ask myself, you know, why am I staying here? What might I have missed? Where am I going to move to in order to change that composition before I take it again, before I make something fresh? Not just iterations of the same thing, but a really, you know, a new frame using those same elements. Um, when working in that way, I'll tend to be uh, thinking in terms of wide, mid and close. Um, if the photograph you, you have, you know, has only one subject, then I tend to move close and fill the frame with that one subject. Uh, if context is important, then I include that. And if there's multiple elements, then you, you've got to make sure you're standing in the right place with a wide enough lens to capture all of it. For me, that's normally with the 35. Um, I think that composition uh, there's a lot of reliance on negative space to kind of uh, isolate things. Um, and I, I feel like that's over relied on when composing and, and with film, this means that you get these huge areas of, of um, you know, blankness for the, for the purpose of rendering nothing. Um, a, with, a, with a minimalist aesthetic, which a lot of people enjoy, um, it's difficult to do both uh, produce both a minimalist frame and a frame that uses the full real estate of each negative. Uh, it's quite a delicate balance because each shot, you know, each shot of film, you're printing a new sensor. Um, you know, it's, it's a small rectangle of reality. You want it to be filled with your image. You don't just want the photograph to be somewhere inside your composition. You want it to be edge to edge. Um, so negative space is something that I only use if it's absolutely essential for the mood of the image. Um, if the scene itself is already inherently minimal, uh, the, the frame I've used in this slide uh, is Katasar Uttar Pradesh in India. Um, in this, the emptiness is part of the story. You know, you've got the layers um, with the foreground and the midground with the figure who's literally on the horizon line and it stretches into nothingness. Um, there's no ocean, there's nothing, it's just desert. Um, it's, it's not useless dead space, it's describing a type of environment. You know, it's, it's the negative space, not for its own sake. Um, because if you're using negative space for the sake of it on film, it means you're spending a lot of nothing, you know, lots of square inches of film that just have, have no, no information, you know, um, which, I, which I think is a waste. Um, when it comes to exposing on film, um, there's only really a few different types of exposure option that I go for. Um, I'll usually be exposing on a subject, there'll be a subject of my image, so I'll be exposing for that subject. Um, which means as accurately as possible, there'll be the detail for that subject. Uh, if I lose highlight detail as a result, if there's nothing in the shadows, it really doesn't matter because what matters is making sure that my subject is absolutely as clear as they possibly can be. Um, for this reason, one of my absolute favorite conditions to shoot in is an overcast day because you only need to meet it once and then you can shoot with you know, really no adjustments until the light changes. Um, on a bright day, I'll choose either the shadows or the highlights without worrying about losing the other. Um, usually I don't lose any detail due to my development process, which I'll discuss later on, um, but I, I choose one or the other and, and focus on that. Uh, if I'm indoors, then I'll usually be aperture wide open, allowing the ambient light of the room to dictate my shutter speed. At an 800 rated film, I'm normally, you know, not below 1 15th of a second indoors. Uh, just moving around the slide here. The photo on the left, I've exposed for the detail in the police tape, which runs along the bottom of the frame. Um, and you can see that because that's exposed for you, you lose all the detail in the sky. You can see the tree is starting to, to lose a bit of detail in the branches. But the thing is that the image isn't about the tree, it's about the police tape and the boy climbing over the wall. And, and you know, those are exposed for. 
um, it doesn't matter that I lose the highlights, which I think is something people care more about with digital because it's it can look differently um, on on a on a digital frame because it blows out much easier and much less gently than this does, where the tree just kind of fades away. You know, um, the upper middle image is shot on an overcast day, so you've got the light in the sky is the same as the light on the on the uh, on the Thames and the same as the light on the boys. Um, you know the the light reflecting off the building it's, it's all fairly evenly exposed then you've got the lower center and the right image are both images which are exposed for the highlights one gives us a bright image and the other gives us a dark image because it, it depends on the conditions that you're shooting in there's no such thing as correct exposure but it's what works for your eye so you know with the with the photograph on the bottom with the sea with the ocean you've got all the detail and the texture of those waves moving off into the white space and the characters are rendered as dark and on the right, you've got the light coming through the woman's face visor, so she's rendered as the shadow. Um, but it's possible to have, you know, a, a very dark image, but you still meet it for those for small amounts of highlight or for large amounts of highlight. Um, it is possible to expose in a way that you know makes all of these images an even tone grey for, for for the middle level. Um, but really, honestly, I don't know why anyone would do that because like even as a technical exercise, it doesn't demonstrate much beyond making a gray frame. You want to be exposing for one thing or the other. And usually that one thing is your subject to make sure that that is clear and everything else, you know, you arrange it compositionally so it just fits. Um, so once you have those uh, negatives, you know, developed and sorted, then uh, storage is um, something that I know people sometimes have questions about. I tend to go for quite a standard, you know, um, I, I take my uh, shot rolls that are undeveloped and I store them in a thermally sealed bag, like a, like a, a thick lined um, cooler bag, like for, a, for picnics, um, because that protects it from any ambient heat that might be affecting them. But usually there, there's not really much of a worry for that. If you are worried about that, or if you live in a warmer climate, you might want to put them in a fridge or a freezer as long as they're sealed away from, from uh, humidity. Um, when it comes to developing my film, uh, I tend to use just one process and that's called stand development. Um, this is a process where you're not agitating the tank, um, but instead just allowing the chemistry to exhaust over the film. Um, the classic kind of chemical feat for doing this is rhodanol, uh, but I think there's been shortages of rhodanol currently because of um, shipping issues. So there's a, an alternative called uh, Panadol S, Paranol S, sorry. Um, uh, which is basically identical to rhodanol, and I've been using that quite happily. Uh, you can also get good results with stand development from HC110, Ilfatec HC, Ilfasol 3. Um, I can make a note of those at the end if, if, if people are looking into that. Um, for pushing or pulling your film, I'll adjust the dilution ratio and timings. Uh, again, that's something I'm having to elaborate on, but I don't want to go, I don't want to do a whole slide on all of those details because it's something that people can look up uh, or ask me about afterwards. Um, but again, this is what works for me. The best thing for you to do is to, to go through trial and error, experimenting on test roles, exposing them in certain ways, developing them in certain ways and figuring out what looks best for you. Uh, I'll tend to wait a few weeks between shooting and developing. Um, but obviously if there's something urgent then I can do it on the same day, I do quite like to have a backlog of, of roles. Um, currently it's around 30 to 50, which, you know, I can revisit that, do a lucky dip, take a roll out, develop it see what's on there and just keep me motivated um, every so often every, every so often um, I'll usually make notes on the canister or on the film leader so I know kind of you know what dates the film was shot in I can arrange things chronologically in my in my folders later um, when it comes to scanning and printing um, again I'll tend to develop my role and then leave it for a bit so that I'm not looking at them on, on the same day uh, I like to wait until, you know, there's a rainy day where I won't be out shooting um, too much and then I'll run through a batch and, and see my images on screen for the first time. Um, I'll make notes as I go, uh, keeping track of what's on each roll. Um, when there's, you know, a particularly interesting or important shot for a project, I'll mark the plastic sleeve that the film stored in so I know what where that frame is. Um, the purpose of my digital scans, like I said earlier, is not to have a finished piece, it's to have an archive of digitized photos for reference um, to accompany any online uh, content I might have and when I want to print it into a publication. Um, only when those images exist physically will I consider it to be, you know, a photograph that exists. Um, 
which means that when I'm working with digital files, aside from slight adjustments on the gamma in Photoshop, when I load them in um, because I scan in TIFF, I'm not making alterations to the files. Uh, the only reason I adjust the gamma is that I find it brings my images as close on screen to the way I, um, that they'll look uh, when I darkroom print them. If I'm using a scan for a publication, I'll also lower the exposure just a little bit um, because photos tend to, to print lighter on the page. Um, it, it just depends on, on what ink and what paper and whether that ink saturates the paper and it tends to um, not saturate as much because I'm not using like thick fibrous paper for uh, my publications yet. Um, for individual images, if they are absolutely breakout superb images, um, <clears throat> if, I, if I feel a certain way about the photograph, if my peers give me certain feedback, then um, I will darkroom print it. And that's mainly what my darkroom process is reserved for. Um, I prefer to have my photograph viewed in sequence first before I release it as an individual print, um, but that can really depend on, on you know, a few different aspects. Sometimes images do just work better as single shots um, and others, you know, I, I can include a darkroom print in the pages of a publication slid, um, you know, in the pages. So it's kind of as a collectible, but it, but it works along with the sequence. Um, if I'm sequencing images in the darkroom to produce a kind of a box set, then I quite like the five by seven kind of postcard format. Um, and a box set for that will be either three, you know, three to 12 images. Um, which can mean, you know, a standout beginning, middle and end photograph from that story or a complete photo essay structured into 12, you know, with three groupings of four images in each. Um, and that way we're led through the beginning, middle and end via the content, which is the who, what, when, where and why, who the character is, what they're doing, where and when as the context, you know, and why is that kind of conclusion or resolution or the call to action or, or the kind of emotional gut punch from that from that work. Um, and again, if you have specific questions about my print process, uh, I can answer them during the Q&A, but if it's something that you're really interested in after all of this, then um, you can actually join me and David Babian in November for a full in-person darkroom course. Uh, that's bookable through Leica Academy as always. Um, there are limited spaces uh, due to the physical space of the darkroom, um, but we can always host more of these sessions depending on demand. Um, and I think uh, in the works for 2022 is a class on working on publications. So if that was an aspect you were interested in, you can keep an eye out for that. Um, if you want to see uh, some examples of kind of finished pieces, narrative stories told through film based on the workflow that I've discussed here during the webinar, uh, I have a selection of my um, India 2019 digest available on my website, which is linked uh, through my Instagram. And you can also find copies of the, of the um, the zine Bardo Summer of 20, which is still for sale on the New Exit um, group website, which was a collaborative documentary project. Again, all shot on film using the ideas I've discussed here and the narrative sewn together um, collaboratively. Um, I sadly don't have any stock of my other publications currently, uh, but you can keep an eye out for those uh, when they're released. Um, if any of you are based in London, if you stop by the Photo Book Cafe, they have a, a few copies of some of my works. Um, Again, if, if you want to go through in depth of, of any of the ideas that I discussed before and see what that looks like as a finished piece. Um, that brings us through to the q and I'm really sorry that this session has been um, more hectic than other. I'm sorry about the disturbance halfway through as well. That was just embarrassing and unfortunate uh, and unprofessional, but not from me. Keeps it real. Um, keeps it real, yeah. Um, so, Yes. We already have quite a few questions. Um, okay, great. Let's get to those. I'm just going to pause for a water break as well. Yeah, of course. So yeah, now is your opportunity to get those questions in. So yeah, please do try and get them into the Q&A panel rather than the chat feed. It's just easier to monitor. Make sure we get them answered for you. Um, I think a good one to start off with would be um, your Sunny 16. Yes. Well, quite a few people have asked that one. Uh -huh. um, so just to kind of read some of those, can you explain your Sunny 16 rating? Do you use a light meter or simply rely on the Sunny 16 rule? And there was another one asking the oh. same thing. Um, can you please explain the Sunny 16 shutter speed and ISO a bit, a bit more? Sure. Um, if only it was my Sunny 16 rule, I'd, I'd probably <laughs> be a lot more famous. Um, sunny 16 is a rule of thumb. It's not a, this will give you correct results every time. It's a um, gets you close, you know, to, to where you want to be. And if you're shooting with a meterless camera, 
um, then it's, it's something that people, a lot of people will rely on. Sunny 16 coupled with, you know, a development process that you have control on from beginning to end will mean that you can expose your film in a certain way and then develop it in a way that matches up to that. So people might take Sunny 16 as a starting point and move from it. Essentially what it means is that on a sunny day, which is a, a day where there's no clouds in the sky, um, you can set your shutter speed to whatever number it reads that is closest to your film. So if you've got a 400 speed film loaded, you set it to um, 500th of a second. Or if you've got an 800 speed film, you uh, set it to 1000th of a second, and then you set your aperture to 16. And that will give you pretty much a correct exposure for the light. If you then a few clouds appear in the sky, you go down to 11. If a few more clouds appear, you go down to eight. If it's um, you know, mostly overcast, you go down to four. And if it's very dark, you go down to 2.8 or two or 1.4 or, you know, whatever's good from there. Um, but, but realistically, it's a way to, um, if I look outside right now and, and this is about, you know, the, there's clouds in the sky, it's towards the end of the day. I would, if I was going to leave my house right now and go and do some photography with, without even, you know, while I'm still going down the stairs, I would be at 500th per second F4 with 400 speed loaded and then when I step out the door I'll be able to go okay well it needs to be slightly lighter or slightly darker that will be based on experience or you can use a meter for fine tuning but it's a way that I want to I want to have as much done into the camera before I put it to my eye as possible so that the only thing I'm doing is moving the focusing tab as it gets to my eye and then pressing the shutter everything else is kind of done in advance if I'm photographing let's say a situation like a carousel where something's moving and it's going dark light, dark light, then I would use a meter to fine tune and go exactly for my subject. Um, or if I'm shooting slide film and I need to be dead on for something, then I would use a meter. Um, like I said, I've, I've, I tend to be in the field with two cameras, um, one metered one without the M6 would be the metered one. So I'll use that to give me the exposure for the other one if I really want to fine tune it. But if I only have the other one, then I'll be using Sunny 16. Hopefully that answers I can, elaborate a little bit more on the specifics of Sunny 16, but without actually, you know, put a camera in your hands, set the set the shutter speed to the ISO speed, and then just change the aperture according to what light, it, light there is. Um, and then put it to your eye check if it has a meter, or if you have a meter externally that you can check against your eye, and then you train your eye to, to kind of learn better. Um, and, and that way you give yourself that tool to, to use onwards rather than always relying on, on some kind of third party mechanism. And, and aside from slide film, how, like how much latitude do you find that you have with film? Kind of, I guess in comparison right. to digital as well, would be quite interesting. So I don't think that latitude is necessarily a real thing on film. Um, so because I use stand development, it means that my highlights are retained, but my shadows are brought out which means that I'm, if I'm exposing for my shadows, I don't need to worry about the highlights being blown out because they won't be, because I'm not agitating to the point at which those highlights get the chance to be blown out by the chemistry. If I go to, um, let's go to, sorry about this. Let's find a, so this photograph, if you look at the sky, you can see there's very faintly some clouds, right? right? But, I've ex but, but even with the exposure for the highlights, they're very faint. And the characters are not detailed because they're <coughs> backlit, sorry. Um, you know, it's, it's a high dynamic range scene, but there's detail everywhere I want there to be. And there's no detail where I don't want there to be detail. And that just comes from exposing and developing in a way that works for me. It's not that I am losing the shadows. I'm just not exposing because I don't want those shadows in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you want latitude, then you can expose for middle gray for a, for a, a halfway and I think, to the best of my knowledge, with film, you get around 10 to 16 stops of dynamic range. But again, it depends on the way that you're developing, because you can develop, um, like you could use a dilution ratio of 50-50 rhodonol and water and just flash develop in one minute and have no dynamic range and just have only shadows, you know, and everything else is blown out. Um, it, it really depends. Sorry that I'm moving my hands so, so excitedly. Um, Rodinal does that sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, you'll, you'll see that the even where there's um, like a gray tone, like in the sky here, you can see there's the hints of where the clouds were. Whereas if this were a digital photo, this would all just be white, yeah. you know? Um, 
think it was this one. So this one, this this really was, there was no, there was basically no sky. It was just, I think, a grey blue because of the pollution. Like you can see that it's a foggy mist. You've got the um, the very clearly defined foreground character is a very dark black, whereas the, um, the mid-ground character is very light grey. And that's because you've got those layers of fog in between, in between them. Um, but again, if you were exposing, you've got the detail in the ground here, this would all just be white. Um, I do recommend stand development just for, for beginners um, because it, it gives you a, a very kind of gray uh, negative to work with, whether you're dark on printing it or, uh, you know, working with it digitally. Um, but I think that scanners prefer or give you a better result from a slightly underexposed negative, whereas you want it to be slightly overexposed if you're going to be dark from printing it, because then you have a denser negative, which means that it s stops more light from going through it from the enlarger. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of variables, it would seem. Um, Deborah is would like to know if whether you can go into more detail to why you think black and white films <coughs> better for narratives in your work. Sure. Um, so, um, photography has a purpose. The purpose of a photograph is that it describes. It describes better than words. You know, you can write a poem or a short story about what a rose looks like, but you still won't someone still won't be able to picture that rose exactly in their heads. Whereas if you take a picture of that rose, it's an excellent representation, you know? So if you're at a level where what you're doing is describing things, then you want to decide whether or not the color is actually an interesting thing worth describing. Now, if I photograph a fashion runway, then I need to have um, the gold of the, of the, the eye liner and the, the, the white dress with the sequins and the red detail like that's all very important those are things that I need to you know describe to you in words so I would want to describe it in the photo so that's a color photograph but if um if that catwalk model trips over and falls then the description is a catwalk model falls and the crowd's looking like this and they're all you know pointing and they've got their phones out at no point in that description do you need um the color involved you know it, it didn't it didn't come into what I was saying you don't need to say um you know if you're describing something that someone's doing, a process, then it's very rare that the colour comes into it. Even if I'm saying, you know, a, a painter is working on his painting, he's painting a landscape, he's painting a mountain, I don't then need to hold your hand and say the mountain is grey and the clouds are white and the sky is blue and the grass is green. I can just describe what the painter is doing and because it's that process, that's the, the narrative aspect and that doesn't need to be described in colour and words, so I don't need to describe it in colour in a photograph either. Um, I think that's quite broadly uh, my explanation. I, I do go, you know, into into kind of deeper philosophical context, but it's uh, it, it gets boring. <laughs> I'm sure it doesn't. No, thank you. Um, what's your angle on movie film negatives, such as Cine Still 800, the Lomo Cine 200, and of course some excellent classic ones like Porta, Ektar, and Trix. Um They're all lovely films. Uh, during research and development processes for different projects I've shot with um, essentially all of them except for some of the Lomo films but I will be getting around to them. Um, they all have their place for my project if I'm going to be photographing um, you know a, a New York at night I know that I'll go to Cinestill 800 just because that gives me the glow and the haze and the kind of Hollywood angle um, <coughs> but they're not um, they're not films that I would shoot on a regular basis because I prefer um, my, my mainstay currently, which is HP5 and Delta 400, um, which will cover me for everything I want to want to be using. Um, they're all great films and they're all worth trying. But I think if you go to a film and go, this film is going to give me this photograph. Like if I take Sinistral 800 and I know that it fits into the kind of New York street aesthetic, but then take a portrait of a friend in their room, that image isn't gonna have the New York street aesthetic because it's not a New York street. It's not a London street, it's just someone in their room. you know. So the film is, on, is gonna take you some of the way, but it's not gonna give you everything. You'll still need to figure out what elements you actually want to include in the photograph. The film is, is, is um, 
you know, I think should be the last consideration in terms of giving you a look. If you want an image to look like a New York street, then find a street with, you know, with the brick walls and the lights and the, the neon. And then that shot taken on any film will look the way you want it to look. It's just that Sinister will give you that extra touch of this or Ecto will give you that little bit of this, you know? Um, and through experimentation, you'll see what each of those films does have to offer you, but they'll only be offering you, you know, something that's a little bit more towards the end of a process than the beginning, in my opinion. Thank you guys, thank you. Would you, should one, use expired film? Um, I have done. Uh, it's usually fairly disastrous. If you don't know how a film's been treated before um, you get it, if you buy like two rolls of something online from a bulk, then, um, you probably won't have the best experience if you're able to find a hundred rolls and they've all been treated the same way and you shoot one of them as a test roll, then you know that how to shoot the other 99. But if you're kind of mixing and matching from lots of different sources, it's not normally going to work out very well. Um, so you can try it, but always try and figure out how it's been handled, whether or not it's been cold stored. And then um, if it's, uh, you know, if it's black and white 100 speed film, it's usually pretty great. I've, I've used Delta, um, 100 from, uh, you know, the early 2000s, and I shot that uh, two years ago, and that was fine. Um, but that's because it's got a lower speed, uh, less degradation has happened to it. I've also shot some uh, Neopan 1600, which expired in the 1990s. Uh, and that was, that came out worse because it had been, you know, treated worse. And because I only had the one roll, I didn't know how much longer I needed to leave it in the stand development. Um, so definitely experiment with it. Uh, but, you know, do your research and your mileage will definitely vary. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael would like to know whether you change film ASA and development time to increase contrast. If so, can you explain your technique? So <clears throat> for, a, for a standard development process, if you push your film, which means rating it at a higher speed and underexposing it. So if I have HP5 400, and I put it in my camera and set my meter to 800, I'm underexposing my film by one stop. And then with a regular development, I would, do, I would add time to, the, develop, to the, the developing process, which then gives me a grainier, more contrasty, but well exposed for a darker situation negative usually. Um, because I stand develop, my film is already in the tank for an hour minimum um, and around three hours maximum, which means that I'm not, changing things to increase or decrease contrast, I'm going for a flat negative, which will then print very nicely. And it's in the print process that you can add different um, contrast filters to give you that. However, um, if I, mm, no, I, I don't really think I would want a, a contrasty negative specifically. I'd prefer to work with something flatter um, and, then, and then bring out the contrast either in the darkroom or uh, through the gamma in Photoshop. But I tend to also, because I'm exposing for either the highlights or the shadows, that is a natural contrast. So if I'm exposing for the shadows, the highlights are going to be high contrast in comparison. And if I'm exposing for the highlights, the shadows are going to be lost in comparison. So it's less something that happens for me in the development stage and more in the shooting stage. Great. Thank you. Um, Claire is wondering whether you would recommend sending out your um, film for development. Well, I suppose it's your only option if you don't have a room for develop, developing yourself. Um, you, <laughs> I don't think you necessarily need a room to develop yourself. I, if you have a, a, a space around the size of two MacBooks, that's what, like 60 centimeters by, by 50, um, then that's enough room to, for a uh, dark bag, uh, development tank, uh, two reel tank, and, um, and the other bits of bobs. Like if, you, if you have a table, you can develop film. Um, you, it doesn't need to be done in a dark room. You don't need a specific space. The dark room is for uh, printing. Whereas when you have the, the tanks and the dark bag, that's all done in, a light, in, the, in the light sealed bag. Um, so I would still recommend you, you take it on for yourself and 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 learn that learn those techniques because you know that the sooner you empower yourself to do that the the more able you are to make the process cheaper overall for yourself 
um, because I think it's something like uh, I think it's AG and Birmingham offer some of the best rates that I'm aware of, and they're they're at four pound a roll just for developing. The last time I checked, and if you're doing four pound a roll every time and you shoot ten rolls, you might as well at that point have bought a dev kit. And I've definitely shot ten rolls. <laughs> um, and and at the point at which you're shooting you know, a project where you want to come home that night and have that one role developed before anything else, or you want to um, have it going on in the background. It, it's kind of, it, it really is adopting a new lifestyle where, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get home, I'll put on my, you know, vegetable steamer, and then I'll also put a role in the tank and I'll just have things going on. You know, it's, it's very nice and calm. Um, and I think that's worth, uh, you know, worth the investment of time in learning in learning to adopt that because then the, the film process becomes ingrained with the rest of your life as well. I mean, I suppose this is a natural um, route to like asking about developing places that you would recommend if you were not going to do it at home. Okay. Although, you, know, you have some um, places which you would go to. The, the place, so, so I send out my um, colour film, which is C41 and E6, and I send those specifically to AG, partially because they have the best rates that I found, and secondly because um, they still mount 35 millimeter slide film. So you get the little shapes that you can put into a, a, um, a projector, and they also give you a very flat scan. Um, there's also a place in um, Hatton Garden called Artful Dodgers, and they will push C41 film. Um, so those are two places that I would recommend they both do things differently um but they'll if you're looking for somewhere that pushes c41 then artful dodger and hatton uh, hatton garden and if you're just looking for a general do it all it'll be ag but I do encourage you if you're going to be doing black and white photography developing your own uh, your own um films it, it, it can't be beat great thank you I've just written those recommendations down um <laughs> Have you, you shot much film, Robin? Sorry? Have you shot much film recently? I've got or... a lot of roles sitting in the fridge. Nice. <laughs> and I'm deciding what to do with it. So that's the next step. Um, do, you, do, or do you or can you use a grayscale rendering adjustment process as there is for color rendering to match monitor to printer profile? Um, I'm sure someone out there can. I wouldn't. Just because even if I even if I perfectly match up my monitor to a printer, um, I'm still not uh, using my own printer to produce something like a publication. So because I'm sending it away, they'll have their own um, profiles. Uh, if I were doing everything in house, then that would be great. Um, because I'm not, especially with my you know with the books and zines and publications, they they're going out. So I'd rather do. Um, test prints and have them send me a few copies of different versions and I can choose between them. Um, and then for a darkroom print, there's not a, a calibration process because it's it's fully analog. Um, no, nothing digital involved in, in exposing the light through the negative. So it's not something that I would, I would look into. Um, but I'm sure if you research, there will definitely be um, someone who, who knows about uh, grayscale rendering adjustments. No doubt. Um, Raul, says have you ever had any issues when traveling with film in particular when it comes to the x-ray machines at airports um <clears throat> that's a difficult question i personally haven't had issues but i know plenty of people who have so don't take me saying that i've had no issues as a sign for you to be careless um uh, america is great at this they'll always hand check i think it's a right that you can ask for, for certain things to be hand checked um, so the, the TSA take that seriously. When traveling through UK airports, they're less careful. Um, there's a brand called Domk, D-O-M-K-E, which do an X-ray protected uh, bag, um, which is pretty good. I tend to put my rolls out of their boxes in the bag and put the bag through separately as its own bag. Um, and I can answer questions about that. Whereas if it's in inside one of my actual backpacks, um, they're more likely to take it out as a suspicious option. Um, you can also just arrive early on the day and, and basically beg whoever you're talking to, say, look, I've arrived too early, I just want to be hand-checked, uh, please do so. Um, if you're looking at something like a, I think it's a CT scanner where it's like a, a, a large, very futuristic looking one with lots of blue lights that will wipe the film 
to the best of my knowledge, whereas if it's an older one, so I've traveled through um, a lot of European countries, some of the Middle East, um, some of India, where, where my bags with, you know, up to 3,200 Delta speeds went through, um, they didn't have any issues with the older models, but I think it's the newer models specifically that do multiple passes uh, where you'll have issues. Um, this is something that I've looked at for when I'm planning projects where I know that I'll be going through areas of, of countries where, you know, I'll have to go through multiple checks and stuff like that. And I've tried to line up um, with different film suppliers for them to have film shipped over or to have it sourced from inside the country to ship it to, you know, different hotels and different safe places so that I can arrive and then collect a box of film from a place and then have that fresh. So it only needs to go through a scanner on the way back. Um, but that's a very kind of intricate involved thing if you're going on some kind of epic voyage. Um, but it can also be an option to just have something sent locally or even to find a local business and support them if you're going to be traveling somewhere, um, which is always nice to do. Great, thank you. Um, Vivek is wondering whether you still find the light meter on the M6 accurate. Accurate, yep. Um, I've never had any issues with it. Um, and if I did, then I would have it CLA'd. Uh, you can check it against um, any other meter because all meters should meter the same. Um, so you, yeah, you can check it up. I, I, I have a, an app on my phone that I also use sometimes and I check it against that and they're identical. Um, so yeah, no, no issues with mine. Which app do you use out of interest? Oh God, what's it called? I have one called <coughs> it's Android. Pocket, Pocket Light Meter. It's just called Light Meter on mine. There we go. Cool. Ignore the Pokemon Go one. <laughs> um, Ardell says, focusing for a second on your documenting process, you described your who, what, when, where, why, how process, and said that you would devote a role to each. Do you strictly stick to the purpose of each role, e.g. the role I'm shooting, the where, the role... I'm shooting the when, or do you mix and match and use the number of roles as a rule of thumb? Have you written any material describing your thought process in more detail anywhere? So that was um, that was like a, a base number. So I, I, I know that I'll need roughly one role to cover each of the topics, but that it won't occur on each role. So I'll have six roles and over the ro those roles, there'll be some who, some what, some why. But I know that roughly over those roles, I'll have most of what I'm looking for. Um, sometimes I do go out and go right today I'm just going to photograph the place and I'll get some landscape shots and some detail shots and some contact shots and sometimes I'll go um, you know I'm feeling very sociable I've, I've had a lot of coffee so I'm going to go and meet people and, and take some character portraits and, and um, see what people are doing um, and that way it naturally becomes one role you can actually see um, I, I, I tried this very hard when I was in India. I, I gave myself one roll of slide film and I said, this is going to be 36 individual portraits and they're all going to be great. And I got about six portraits in and I was like, wait, I hate portraits. Why am I doing this? And then the role kind of became something else. But you can track through that and see kind of the direction I took with it when I was trying to do one thing but became distracted by other things. Um, I have that as a slideshow video on my YouTube and I think there's also an article in Emulsive. So if you search... Um, I think Simon King, Ectochrome, Varanasi, you'll, uh, you'll find that one. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I, I, I have tried to, to assign one role to one purpose, but it's much easier to let yourself be free and to know what you're shooting and to have the roles ready to shoot those things, but not to, um, not to, to kind of enforce. Great. Thank you. Um, and just to, there were a couple of people asking whether this was being recorded and sent out. It is. Um, so do expect an email in a, a day or two with uh, yeah, a, a download link for this webinar. Okay. Um, Tim wonders whether you use modern glass on your um, cameras or <coughs> at the same era as your M2, M6. That's... A great question because it depends on what you describe as modern glass. I think my most modern lens would be the 90 Apo, but I think even that is from what the early thousands. Yeah, I think in? so. Yeah. So, so whether or not you consider that modern, um, but it would it would be the latest 90 f f two. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Current yep. current lens. Exactly. Exactly. It's so it's current, but I don't know whether or not that means modern depending yeah. on, 
on what how we're defining things um it, it is my favorite lens it's incredible uh but then i also have um you know i think i think i've got a, a similar vintage 50 f2 um i've somewhere here i've got um an old goggles i've got an old goggles 35 um i've got the, the 90 f4 so whatever um whatever vintages those are i'm not really a a, a kind of vintage connoisseur person um, but I do think that most of the rendering um, on film will be fairly similar, whether or not you're using something super modern or super classic, um, because it's being rendered onto film. The film is the the kind of bottleneck, is the limiting factor. Because I know that some of those older lenses can render, you know, perfectly even onto 50 megapixel sensors, whereas um, film is not a 50 megapixel sensor, so it will give you more of a look sometimes than the than the uh, lens will. Aside from when you're looking at the characteristics like you know, focal length and bokeh and stuff like that. Um, but in terms of like sharpness, I, I, I haven't seen any difference in sharpness between, you know, older older lenses and, and uh, what do we call it? Modern, a modern design. Modern yeah. Current. Current, <laughs> current, that was it. Um, go on, another um, kit related question from Louise. Hello, Louise. Um, thank you, Simon, for an inspiring informative talk. I'm a digital camera user and I'm tempted after listening to your talk to try out film. What film camera should I try as a beginner, apart from the M6? Thank you. Right. So with Leica, um, there are a few options and there are only a few options where I think someone moving from digital to film should start. And by that, I mean, um, I would recommend starting with a camera with a built-in meter. Um, if you want to try not using the meter you can just take the batteries out whereas if you buy a meterless camera you've got to do a whole you know either put a hot shoe one in or buy an external one it, it becomes very involved um so <clears throat> the options for um film cameras with meters would be the leica m5 the leica m6 the m7 and the mp the m7 um i won't talk about the m6 the m5 and the mp are all excellent um and I think uh, if you go, I think uh, most of the, the Leica flagship shops have, have good uh, both first and second hand um, MPs and, and classic models, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, the, the current um, film camera would be the MP, which is still in production. Um, they're the only one that has the option to use a, 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 a meter. Mm -hmm. Of the current production ones, yeah. Of the current production, yeah. And that is basically speak to anyone with an MP and you know that they are not looking at selling it anytime soon. They are, you know, if you want to be shooting film for as long as film is around, that's the camera. Um, but I'm sure that um, case by case, you can speak to a, a, a like a salesperson and they'll, they'll kind of guide you to the, 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 the camera that makes sense. Um, but I, I, I do think that M6s are very popular for a reason. Um, in the second-hand market, and it's simply because they they do everything the way they're supposed to, and then the MP just makes the experience that much more, you know, smooth and fluid and current and um, you know, reliable and and stuff like that. If if, if that's what you're after. Great, thank you. Um, Justin says, with such frugal shooting approach, how easy to miss the decisive moment? Um, it's the easiest thing to miss a shot because everyone everyone misses shots. If I miss the shot, then I'll be very, very upset. But I think it's just as easy to miss a shot on film as it is with digital. Because if I'm, you know, if I'm in the headspace and my camera's ready and it's to my eye and it's cocked and it's loaded and I know everything that's going on, then I'm in a position to take the shot. But if I'm in that same position with digital, then I'm also in a position to take the shot. If I'm not in, if, you know, if I'm at a cafe and my camera's upside down and it's in my bag and it's by a window and then the shot's happening over there, whether or not I'm on digital or film, I'm going to miss the shot. So it's not necessarily about being frugal because if the shot is happening, I will take it. And I do tend to take it more often than not. And I will give myself leeway to take a shot where I can decide later whether or not it was the shot. Um, that's not what I think being frugal is. Being frugal is being aware of each moment that I'm not just shooting for the sake of it or because it feels good to press the shutter that I'm shooting because the, the thing that I've got in my viewfinder right now is worth me putting down onto my film and whether or not that's a personal moment or you know if I'm if I'm if I'm at a friend's birthday and something funny happens I'll take the shot and it's not that I don't feel that I would waste it it's because it's 
the shot that I wanted to take, you know? Um, I'm not holding back. I'm just not um, shooting for the sake of it. I'm shooting for the sake of me. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, Christian is asking, if you could only bring one lens, what would you pick to be the most versatile? Most versatile? For me, it would be a 50. Um, I know for a lot of people it would be 35. The reason I don't tend to prefer 35 most of the time is because I wear glasses. So if you wear glasses, that'll be a factor. Um, I think that the classic rangefinder lens for, you know, for travel and for personal documentary work is the 50. Um, and I, I think it, I think it will, will stay the 50. And just to explain um, the glasses comment, it would mean that you wouldn't be able to see your frame yep. as well. Yeah, it's, it's something I've mentioned during a few webinars, but it, it'll always give me that pang that I don't have perfect eyesight. Yeah. Um, but when, when Leica start offering the laser eye surgery, I'll, I'll be first in line. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Rebecca was wondering the name of the kit that you mentioned, and that <laughs> the dark bar, the dark bag uh, development kit. Um, so there's a brand called Patterson with one T. Uh, they do um, uh, the dev tanks, the reels, the bags, they'll, they'll do it all. You can go on um, websites like Speed Graphic, have a, uh, a Patterson Ilford collaborative kit whereby it's both companies and you get the, uh, all the physical stuff and then you get like a starter pack of some chemistry, uh, which is pre-measured out so, so that it kind of makes it easier for first comers to not, you know, put in too much and, and, um, and, and ruin everything. Thank you. Um, and Philip is asking whether you've ever used infrared film. Um, I have. Uh, it's nice. I think it's more of a um, more of a special purpose, like landscape film, which I'm not the biggest fan of. Uh, what I have tried recently that I did enjoy is something called Ilford Ortho, um, which is an 80 speed orthochromatic film, which means that blues and reds are um, kind of changed a little bit. You'll get much darker reds. Um, which means that for things like skin tone, you get a, a like a, a rich um, textured skin tone because uh, the um, kind of lighter aspects are missing. Um, I would I would play around with that as a documentary photographer more than um, infrared uh, film just because of the way that it, it, it renders people. Great, thank you. Um, Callum asked, how do you feel about interacting with your subject matter and influencing what you're documenting? Um, interacting with I think is is fine influencing is a different thing I think that there's and I, I've gone into this previously with my webinar on ethics um you know there's staging and posing and there's you know being in someone's house you know if, if someone invites me into their house and I'm documenting them I have interacted uh influencing would then be you know if I say stand on your head in the kitchen that would be a direct you know a piece of fakery because I've made something happen but if someone's showing me around their life um, and inviting me into their you know their day-to-day -day activities and then something's happening to them as long as I'm not telling them stuff as long as I'm not um, putting myself into the scene because there'll be things that I you know there'll be my expectations of the scene there'll be things that I think I should be seeing or things that I think I should be showing my viewers but if I make those things happen then I'm not really documenting I'm, I'm creating you know and, and collaborating is great because I'm being invited into a space, but as soon as I start creating from my mind, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's more ethically questionable. But I, I, I've covered that in, um, in a separate webinar, which you can find online. Thank you very much. And Simon, or Simon, perhaps, um, is asking whether you tend to choose films based on their character. P3200 um, for contrast, grain, Tri-X for the old school look, etc. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't choose any film based on the look that they would supposedly give me because I think that you get more of a look change from the way that you expose and the way that you develop. I can, I can expose HP5 and develop it so that it looks like 3200 or so that it looks like Tri-X. Um, you know, I can print in a certain way so that it looks like different things. I don't want to be making my decisions on a film based on what it's going to do for me. I want to be doing stuff on the film. So um, I would... I would prefer for people, well, I, I can't prefer for people to do anything. I prefer for people to make their own decisions based on, you know, buy one of each, go through the experimentation, try and shoot a bit of what you want to be shooting on, on each, and then 
see whether or not the look matches up with how you think it should look. But if it doesn't, and you, you've got a particular film that you like, then move on to experimenting with that one film and going, okay, well, what if I develop it like this? Or what if I use these chemicals? Or what if I, um, you know, soak it in wine for three days? And what if I put a little bit of bleach in the tank? Or something? I probably don't do that. Um, I think that would be bad. Uh, but you can do that on paper. <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you can play around with, with one film and, and make it do lots of things, but that's through uh, chemistry. So instead of spending money, spend time. Good advice. And that was our last question. I think uh, there were a few the, further the above, if you scroll up. Did we, uh, the confrontations and integrity, someone wants the recording 50 or 90. Do we have time to answer those or do you need to be heading? I uh, are these, is this in the chat feed? In the q and I have nine open questions. Oh, maybe that's because they came in. They might have come through before. I have, I have quickly, this. <laughs> okay, let me quickly go through these. Of course. Um, how can I transfer my film photographs into a digital content? I use a PlusTech 8100 scanner for my digital scans. Um, although the slide on the screen currently is a, a, a physical photograph, a, a digital photograph rather made with a camera of my prints. Um, where do I get my film processed in my bathroom? Uh, have I been confronted, confronted with people questioning the integrity nature of your work? Uh, I think that question came through when I was speaking about the integrity of film. And yes, one of the reasons I, I started using film was that I had um, some photographs where people were, were um, adamant that I had, you know, staged or faked um, a scene or set things up uh, or changed the colours afterwards. I had a few of them and th there was no real way for me to prove that, that um, you know, even if I show someone a... Uh, a, a set of, of raw files. They'll just say that the raw files were manipulated. So having those physical images, um, Simon said the, uh, the one where I caught the flash mid shot. Yeah, plenty of people said that that was um, like drawn in afterwards. So when, when, you, uh, when you see that shot in the, um, there's a Petapixel article about it. I've actually given them specifically the shots taken before and after because it's the best I can do uh, without a, you know, a digital contact sheet. Um, if this person means whether or not I've been confronted with people questioning the integrity of my, my nature of my work in the field, yes, I have been. And for that, I find it useful to, I've got one here. I've, I've started printing these very tiny things, which, I, which I'm not selling, but it's just a very small um, portfolio of images. So if someone comes up to me and confronts me about um, the nature of my work, it's very nice and friendly to hand them like a very small um, thing and go, you know, here I am, I'm very friendly. Uh, I'm not out to make anyone into something that they're not. I'm just, you know, working on whatever my project is. And it's a lot better to hand someone that and go, here I am, than to pull out your phone and go look at my Instagram, because anyone, that could be anyone's Instagram. Um, hopefully that answers both the questions you could possibly have asked. Um, will you be sent the recording? Yes, hopefully. <laughs> um, <clears throat> does 90 or 50 correlate to flat or deep depth of field or texture of composition? Um, with 90 or 50 millimeter, you can compose with depth, but you also can compose uh, for flatness. Um, usually it depends on, on how close you are to your subject, uh, combined with the aperture, combined with the, with the, um, the focal length. Um, it, it really depends. Um, you, you can play around with, with both focal lengths and, and uh, you know, photographs of depth. I think the majority of the images through this slideshow have been on 50. Um, I think uh, on the right hand side, that's a 90 shot. The middle two were both 50 and the left one was also 50. So if you consider those to be particularly um, deep, rich images, then, then uh, that's what those images have given you. And if you don't, then uh, try, try, for a, uh, try for something longer. Um, why choose the M2 over the M4? Uh, it's, I, I, I quite like the M2. Um, it's personal preference, that's all. Loading would be faster with the M4, um, but for, for the decisions I was making at the time when I bought it, the M2 made the most sense to me. Um, if, you, if you think the M4 would be better, then, then shoot that. I also think the M2 is useful because it just has the three frame lines that I use the most, 35, 50, 90, uh, very clearly and kind of no excess. Uh, Valerie's asked, if shooting in a hot climate, 
how do you protect your film stock? So I will keep my film shaded. I'll keep it in a uh, in a sealed bag. I have a um, I think they're used for canoeing. It's like a a dry bag where you fold the top over a few times and then clip it with a with um with a with a with a buckle, um, and that prevents any moisture or anything from going inside. Um, and that's uh, uh, the most effective way to protect it. I also just don't leave it out in the sun. I don't leave it on a car dashboard. I keep it in my bag. Um, and if I really wanted to, then I put it in a cooler bag as well. Um, and then you've asked what kinds of clients request my type of work. So for documentary work, um, if I'm being commissioned as a service, that will be events photography, that will be portrait photography, that will be wedding photography, anywhere where a story needs to be told. But there are also the stories where um, uh, things like events, photojournalism, where film is actually becoming very, very popular, but more um, color than black and white. But I still see more uh, film photographers shooting in the field than I used to, because editors have started to ask for you know physical negatives to be brought to them rather than digital files, because even they are aware of, of um, the issues that digital photography is offering. So any situation where, whereby a story needs to be told and a client wants you to tell it, um, that's, that's the kind of client that we would be requesting this type of work. And then um, Valerie's asked, what does the term push mean in terms of film and the opposite? So pushing and pulling uh, with film is a physical thing that goes on. You both have to over or underexpose your film in the camera, and then you have to over or underexpose it during the development process, which means leaving it for less time or more time. If you're pushing film, that means underexposing it to start with, and then uh, and then bringing that out in the development. Or if you're pulling the film, you're underexposing it, um, and then bringing it back with the dev, so leaving it in for a little bit less time. Um, but again, because I use a stand development process. Um, it's a little bit more, uh, or you, you get less out of that kind of process. Okay. I think that's everyone now. Sorry, Robin, that you didn't have it was There was actually one last one that's popped up online, okay. actually. Um, Grizel says, <laughs> where's the best place to share um, the project, I guess, your work, and get more clients? Um, depends on the client. Uh, the best way to share work, in my opinion, like I've said, through the project is um, through print. Um, it's far more effective to... to meet someone to present them with a printed portfolio and to say, here's my work. Um, in order to get more clients, again, that's down to your, your ability to pitch a project or to pitch um, their desire to want you to buy your work um, as prints that if it exists or if they want you to produce new work, then you need to pitch them um, on, the, on the, 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 the power of the project itself. Um, I've done a webinar previously on portfolios and designing a portfolio. So hopefully that would answer some of your questions because I know we had similar ones during the Q&A session of that one. And again, you can find that online. Um, but if not, then just send me an email. And I'll, I'll be more specific about, about my process in, in terms of uh, tackling that. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I believe that one is the last question. Um, Great. I know you, I think it's a quick last, um, chance to ask you about the the weekend of yes. um, darkroom printing for beginners which in, happened in margate in november yep can you give us a bit of an insight in terms of what you would learn on that weekend sure so if any of you have come from this and decided that you've um you know you want to shoot some film and that you want to follow that process all the way through from loading the role into your camera exposing that role with photographs developing that role and then when you have that role developed, you've just got this group of negatives, you still can't see the photos. Now, the negative is a negative in terms it's inverted because it's designed to, to have light projected through it onto a piece of photosensitive paper, which then picks up um, you know, the image. And that's the photograph, that's the physical artifact, you know. Um, so our we our um not webinar, our in-person workshop in Margate will be a two-day course. Uh, the first day will be um, basically shooting and hanging around and and um, and uh, engaging, and then um, the second day will be fully in the darkroom, which means that we'll either take um, you know the roles that we shot the previous day and develop them and then uh, print them, or we'll um, hopefully and what we advise is to turn up with negatives already shot that you want to print. We'll then go through um, uh, loading film into an enlarger how to treat darkroom paper, how, you know, general um, darkroom sensibilities, um, 
producing prints and then producing prints in a way that is good to your eye, not just what we're telling you to do. So, you know, so you can be a bit more creative with it. Um, I think somewhere I've got, uh, this is a, a recent dark print I produced of one of my most popular photographs, which is a man on the subway. But with this one, I've tried to emphasize the border so you can see it's the full frame. I've tried to bring out aspects. I've, I've made it a little bit darker here. So you get the detail of the shirt, but so that he's the only thing that's coming through. Sorry about the reflection of the screen. Um, but yeah, we'll be producing as many of these as people have patience for and really being inside the film process from beginning to end. Hopefully Great. that appeals to some people. Yeah, it appeals to me. I mean, that was recently added onto the Leica Academy program page. Um, it's, it's quite limited though. It's only, I think there's only five places available. I think there's already one gone. Um, but yeah, if you're interested, have a look <coughs> quickly. Oh, and, and something we should advise people um, is that uh, we, what we have control over is the space and, uh, you know, the darkroom space and the places on that. What we don't have control over is hotels. So we want to advise people to book those as soon as possible as well, because those do sell out and that's not something we have power over. Um, so if that's something that we can let the, the student who's already booked and then anyone else who might be interested, um, we, we only just thought of that. Uh, so to let people know that. Yes. Um, yeah, hopefully that's been good for people. That's hopefully they've enjoyed lots of Lots of thanks coming in the chat. So yes, thank you very much. Great. Simon, apologies that I couldn't join you for the beginning part. Yeah, I'll be really catching sorry up on about the recording all, the, um, too. all the issues that happened today. <laughs> uh, we we can edit those out for the recording, right? Because it's digital; it's not film, so we can uh, we can pretend they didn't happen. <laughs> and I hope your flatmate's okay. Oh, I'm sure he isn't. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much, and have a good evening, all, and hope to see you on the next one.